Good morning again, everybody. It is now 10.20 a.m. We have nine members present. We need 10 for the quorum. Ms. Galancher, Mr. Pacheco, Mr. Weiss, your presence is needed in council chambers. Buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos al Council de la Ciudad de Bienvenidos a la Cámara de Council. Bienvenidos a la Junta del Council de la Ciudad para hoy, martes, junio 25 de 2002. El Council se junta todos los martes, miércoles y viernes a las 10 de la mañana. Y los Council están abiertos para el público. También podemos ser vistos en vivo por el canal 35. Y podemos ser vistos por el webcast en la página de la Ciudad de Bienvenidos. Thank you, Mr. President. Gracias, Let me invite Déjeme to the podium uh, Brother Brahmananda, Brahmananda, who is from the South Realization Fellowship Relación Center in Pacific Palisades, 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 an area that is open to the public for para tranquil um, thought and moments, uh, as we all need here, of uh, inspiration and uh, tranquility in our lives. And ask Brother Brahmananda first if he would like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll have a moment of inspiration. So I should ask everyone to please stand. Let's begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I'm Brother Brahmananda. I'm a monk and minister with Self-Realization Fellowship Church. We're an international organization with headquarters at the top of Mount Washington, founded by Paramas Yogananda. Our foremost aim as an organization is to encourage people of all faiths to spend time each day in prayer, meditation, God communion. And we teach yoga techniques of meditation to help interiorize our consciousness so that we can feel God's presence and the peace within. Now, we operate in several council districts. On Mount Washington, we're primarily in Ed Reyes' district with some of our properties in Eric Garcetti's. Next week, we'll be in Nick Pacheco's district, the little part of our property in Ed Reyes. Our Hollywood temple is on Sunset Boulevard opposite the Kaiser Hospital. We're in Tom Lombanda's district, but next week we'll be in Eric Garcetti's. <laughs> All right. Well, finally, our Lake Shrine Temple and Ashram Center is at the west end of Sunset Boulevard, and uh, it's in Cindy Miskakosti District. And next week, we'll remain in Cindy Miskakosti District. And we thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Several days ago, I was speaking with our president, Sri Dayamata, who is regarded as a, as a saint by many people, including myself. And she commented to me that ever since September the 11th, she's been thinking deeply on four subjects that she believes will really help people if they can just follow it. And I'd just like to mention them briefly. The first is loving God. We've come from God. He's our creator, our mother, our father. If we could just spend some time alone with God each day, just a few minutes, I can add enormously to our spiritual progress, our sense of who we are. The next one is service, and this is where all of you are outstanding in your lives, and, and we 
congratulate you for the feeling you have of the divine in others and your willingness just to help other people. The third is courage. We can't get by in this world without it. There's always a little bit of fear in our lives, and we have to get by that, stand up, and say, I'll do it. Finally, Faith in God. It's so important. That's what gives the greatest courage. I'd like to close with a prayer, concluding with the favorite prayer of our founder, Paramahansa Yogananda. Heavenly Father, we ask thy special blessing on this city of Los Angeles, the city of your angels, and on this city council. Guide them always with thy love, thy peace, thy harmony. And may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. May we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much. Mr. Kirk, first item, please. Approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Pacheco moves and Mr. Rudy Thomas seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Labange moves and Mr. Weiss seconds. Before proceeding with the amount of today's agenda, we do have one uh, presentation scheduled for today. There's a special event this evening. Uh, I'd like to recognize Council Member Garcetti uh, to be joined by the Mayor of the City of Los Angeles, James Hahn. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the public and colleagues. We have one of the giants of American society here with us today in City Council. Robert Johnson, or Bob as he's known, is the founder of Black Entertainment Television. And tonight, uh, from the famous Kodak Theater in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard, the BET Awards uh, will be celebrated there today. The proclamation that is before us lists in great detail the giant accomplishments of this man, the contributions he has made to American society, to the media, uh, and to uh, the entertainment industry here in this country. Let me share with you some of the highlights. Um, Robert L. Johnson is the founder and chief executive officer of Black Entertainment Television, BET, a subsidiary of Viacom and the leading African-American operated media and entertainment company in the United States. It has enjoyed extraordinary financial and strategic success since its inception in 1980. Um, before. Uh, starting BET, Mr. Johnson was from 1976 to 1979 the Vice President of Governmental Relations for the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. He also served, serves on the following boards, and this is indeed an impressive list. U.S. Airways, Hilton Hotels Corporation, General Mills, the United Negro College Fund, the National Cable Television Association, and the American Film Institute. He's also a member of the Board of Governors for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio, and the Brookings Institute. He has received countless awards, too many to list here today, but some of them include 1997 Broadcasting and Cable Magazine's Hall of Fame Awards, CTAM's Grand Tam Award, Cablevision Magazine's 2020 Vision Award, which lists him as one of the 20 most influential people in the cable industry, and NAACP Image Award. Um, he also has received the National Women's Political Caucus Good Guys Award. A Distinguished Alumni Award from, the, from Princeton University, that no doubt uh, Councilmember Weiss will be happy to know, and the President's Award from the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. BET has pioneered an entire genre in television with its 24-hour programming that targets the African-American consumers and now reaches almost 72 million U.S. homes and more than 95 percent of all black cable households. It's also evolved into leading-edge digital technology via the BET Digital Networks umbrella. And in 1998, Johnson established BET Pictures and BET Arabesque Films to produce and market African-American film releases. 
It is with great joy that I present this proclamation signed by the entire city council and the mayor of this city, James K. Hahn. I'd like to invite the mayor to step forward as well to say a few words, um, and Councilmember Ridley Thomas, if you'd like to do so too. Thank you, Mr. President, and members of the council. It's truly a great day in Los Angeles to have the BET Awards in Hollywood at the new Kodak Theater. Robert L. Johnson certainly is a visionary, someone who saw the promise and the potential of cable television, especially uh, what BET was about, you know, bringing a viewpoint, bringing news uh, with different perspective uh, to the African American community, in fact, the broader community of America. And that's special voice needed to be heard and was heard and continues to be heard. And I think that kind of vision, uh, that kind of pioneering spirit is what makes America great. And we're certainly very proud uh, to have this event here and to have Mr. Johnson here. And uh, I join with the City Council in uh, proclaiming it BET Day uh, in Los Angeles. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Garcetti, in Robert Johnson we have creativity, ingenuity, and industry epitomized. It is punctuated with a sense of cultural specificity as BET has caused uh, the nation to have a glimpse of African American culture and life. And it indeed helps make uh, this nation what it can and ought to be. And so it is my view that Bob Johnson has made a tremendous contribution uh, to the education of Americans from every background by way of exposing them to uh, this particular ethnic group and its contributions to the greatness of this republic. And so I think on behalf of the residents of the city of Los Angeles, we uh, want to commend and salute Bob Johnson on this day, uh, and that is indeed on behalf of a grateful city. June 25th, 2002 is BET Day. Congratulations, Bob, and also Deborah Lee, who's here from uh, BET as well. Congratulations. Mr. Pacheco. Mr. Pacheco. Thank you, uh, President Padilla. Oh, I yield to the council member. <laughs> well, he said that so flowingly, he may be running for office, probably. No. Would that be eight or ten? Um, <laughs> okay, why not? Come on in. Everyone else is running. 14. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, I just want to commend you, first of all, for being a trailblazer. In the, uh, obviously, in, I, I've seen BET on cable, and I really think you're doing a quality job providing a great service uh, to not only the city of Los Angeles, but the entire country. And we also hope uh, to join you with CTV, as you are aware of, well aware of that great effort to bring a, a Latino channel onto cable. But I just want to commend you. Uh, personally for opening the door for all of us who seek more diversity and people of color in front of the camera and behind the camera. Thank you. Mr. Labanche. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Council, there's nothing better than entertainment of all. And Black Entertainment Network, congratulations. I also know that uh, when I was young, another young guy named Travis Smiley was working in here as a counselor. And, uh, he uh, climbed the ladder and is now uh, in other areas in entertainment, but your network was the one gave him a springboard. So uh, that's also encouraging because so many great people have come through these chambers and it's a pleasure to have you in Los Angeles and this great tribute tonight at the Kodak Theater at Hollywood and Highland and uh, hope you enjoy a walk down the boulevard there too. And, Enjoy our city and your visit. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Assistant, I forgot to mention, Bobette is an Angelino uh, from University High School, West Los Angeles. 
Thank you very much. Uh, President Padilla, uh, Mayor Hahn, uh, Council Member Garcetti, Council Member Thomas, uh, and other members of the Council and friends. Uh, uh, I'm uh, honored to be here, of course, and to uh, be in uh, Los Angeles for this event tonight. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce to you the person who really, truly runs BET. I get to take all the credit. She does all the work. It is the President and Chief Operating Officer, Ms. Deborah Lee. In fact, Deborah is so excited about being here when we uh, had a brief chat with uh, uh, President Padilla, he said, uh, welcome to Los Angeles, delighted the show is here, hope you'll bring the show here every year. Deborah Lee shook his hand and said, done deal, we'll be here every, every year. As we were walking away, though, I reminded her, she made the same promise to Mike Bloomberg in New York, so... Uh, but uh, we, are, we are absolutely honored to be here because uh, what we do is what uh, Los Angeles is famous for, and that is the intellectual creativity of the entertainment and artistic community here. And BET has married itself with that tremendous asset and distributed around the, the country and indeed in many places around the world to showcase the vitality and creativity of the African-American entertainment community community to audiences all across the country and all across the world. And uh, we think it's, it's fitting that uh, our award show should be here in the entertainment capital. Uh, it should be at the Kodak Theater. Uh, and it should represent uh, to uh, all of our viewers the excitement of Los Angeles. And we will do that in the uh, multitude of talented artists and performers that will be there tonight. We are honored that we will be presenting the Humanitarian Award to none other than Muhammad Ali. Uh, an individual by his courage and accomplishment stands as a giant uh, throughout the world. We'll also be recognizing one of the pioneer R&B groups uh, to ever come on the scene, Earth, Wind, and Fire. And um, they, too, have uh, set the stage for many of the young artists that follow in their footsteps. And finally, something I'm, I'm pleased to do is to I'll be giving, uh, for the first time, a chairman's award to none other than Dr. Bobby Jones of the Bobby Jones Gospel Show. And, uh, those of you who know anything about African-American music know that gospel music is truly the soul of African-American music. So we are absolutely honored to be here. Uh, the support that we receive from all community agencies, uh, particularly the uh, law enforcement agency, has been absolutely outstanding. Uh, we have received tremendous press coverage, and uh, we are looking forward to a very exciting and wonderful event. And uh, I can't, uh, as I said before, think of a better place for us to showcase what is truly a, a product uh, that you export around the world, and that's the creativity of this community. So, uh, congratulations to uh, uh, all of uh, the people who have been a part of this uh, in your community, and we thank you for your support, and we will be back again as Deborah promised. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Garcetti, Mayor Hahn, Councilmember Rick Thomas. Um, so clerk, proceeding with the agenda, as part of item number nine, a request that that matter be continued until Friday, June 28th. Uh, members request to continue item number nine to this Friday, June 28th, with item number nine, uh, members request to continue item number nine to this Friday, June 28th, without objection, that item shall be continued. As part of item number 19 on the regular agenda, is actually a duplicate of item number 37. As much as it is a duplicate, not required, item number 19 can be received 
Estoy en el Estoy en el archivo. 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 Estoy en el Uh, to allow us 12 votes uh, opportunities on ordinances. Members, let me also announce at the beginning of the meeting that I have your attention for just a second. Uh, this being the last week of the fiscal year, uh, all matters will be going forth with. All matters will be going forth with this week, beginning with today. Okay, uh, so items 1 through 6 being held on the desk. Uh, I do not have requests from members of the public to be heard on those items, so for items 1 through 6, we shall deem the public hearings open and closed, and we'll await Ms. Galancher for an actual vote on those items. Mr. President, item number 7 is an ordinance that will remain on the desk. Item number 8 and 10 through 17 are items where public hearings have been held. Public hearings have been held on these items. We do have a card on item 17 that moved from the floor is required to reopen the public hearing. Members wishing to call any specials, items 8 or 10 through 17. 17 calls special by Mr. Garcetti. Any other specials? And we're not there yet, Mr. Burnson. Any other specials? Items 8 or 10 through 16? Seeing no further specials, Mr. Clerk, please open the roll on those items. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Those so items are approved. approved. Next item, please. Mr. President, item number 18 is uh, acceptance of a bid, tax revenue and anticipation notes. Uh, CAO is currently uh, reviewing the numbers on this matter, so this matter should remain on the desk until we do have the information from the city administrative officer. Okay, item 18 shall be held on the desk. Items numbers 20 through 36 on the regular agenda are items for the public hearings have not been held. Item number 24, a motion is required in this message that the report is submitted without the committee recommendation. Item 24, let's call that special. Items 20 and 21 being ordinances, let's hold those in the desk, Mr. Burnson. Point of order, Mr. President. Uh, my understanding is that merging uh, 19 and 37 and continuing until tomorrow, we have people who have traveled from Granada Hills who are here uh, to testify on this, and I wonder if we couldn't uh, somehow, before we get into the specials, hear from them so they can go back. Seeing Mr. President, you now have 12 members to wish to consider the ordinances. Please consider all ordinances, 1 through 7, 20, and 21. Members wishing to call any of the ordinances special? Seeing none, and not having any requests from the public to be heard on those items, uh, public hearing requirements are satisfied. Mr. Clerk, could please open the roll on all ordinances. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Those items are approved. On the supplemental agenda, items numbers 38 and 39 are items for public hearings that have not been held. Items 38 and 39, I do not have requests from the public to be heard on these items. Please deem the public hearing open and closed, and members without objection consider items 38 and 39 as part of today's agenda. Members wishing to call either of those items special. Items 38 and 39 are items for public hearings that have not been held. Members wishing to call either of those items special. 
Please come forward at this Por favor, time. Ven adelante en este momento. Mr. Hunter. Señor Hunter. Gracias, señor presidente. Good morning. I'm uh, sorry that, I, that you're going to hear this tomorrow because I'm going to make this wonderful speech and maybe you'll forget it. <laughs> I'm Mary Edwards and I represent three community groups in the San Fernando Valley, the North Valley Coalition, LASER, which is Landfill Alternatives Save Environmental uh, Resources, which is a group that comes together from all of the different landfills all around Southern California, and also the, the uh, Old uh, Ladies Women's Club who does other things besides play bridge. They're very interested in recycling. I wanted to bring to you today the importance of not only funding recycling through this and, and complying with 939, but also the fact that in the way it's written right now on gross receipts, everybody, whether uh, unless they have a pure recycled load, will pay exactly the same thing. And we would like to see that recycling facilities, anything that goes to recycling facility is exempted from that. This is very, very important because you have out there many, many recycling facilities, I believe over 150, that are willing or more that are willing to, and able to and permitted right now to take recycling and they want more of the waste stream. But the problem is if you throw it in a landfill and put a tarp on it at the end of the day, it's easy and very inexpensive in the short term. But of course in the long term it ruins the water table. It, uh, expands natural resources that are very, very important. And so it's just a very short term, uh, it's cheap in the short term. But in the long term, we, if it goes to recycling, our resources are reused. So we really, really want to promote recycling. And a way to do that is to have the franchise fee apply only to uh, the things that go to, into the landfill directly, but if it goes to a recycler first, they should be exempt. It's a very simple concept, and I know that some, there's been some argument about how, how hard it would be to audit, but when there's not that many companies to audit, I, and they already have to actually report these statistics that go separately, they can, it, it can be done, it can be done easily, it's direct, it's simple, and you could do with the stroke of the people so much to promote recycling because the facilities are already there and the impetus in our society usually is to go to, it would level the costs and the, and the impetus in our society is to go where the where costs are cheapest. So I would hope you would, I know probably out of time, but I'm already old woman. I, anyway, please consider this. Thank you very much, Mr. Hunter, Hunter. Ms. Becky Ben-Dixon, followed ben by Dixon, Joan Edwards, Edwards and Edwards. Judy Gregory. Thank you. My name is uh, Wayne Hunter. I'm with the North Valley Coalition. I apologize for not having my speech ready. I usually have quite a, a great deal of time to get ready before I'm heard. This is a kind of a surprise to me. Uh, my personal preference is to speak to you tomorrow when you uh, hear these issues again. But since we've been given the opportunity, uh, I'd like to take advantage of it. Uh, we are uh, in favor of the uh, recycling fee because, um, or the franchise fee, because we think that it will help recycling. Uh, however, we do have some concerns about how it's being handled. We believe that it should be based on the tonnage disposed and not gross receipts. Uh, on one hand, you have 
the Bureau of Sanitation, and the big three, which would be BFI slash allied waste, waste management, and Republic. On this hand, you want those receipts. On the other hand, you have the environmentalists and the recyclers and organizations uh, like our homeowners organization that support having the fee based on tonnage disposed. So you, you have these entities. Now, the recyclers are obviously for recycling. The environmentalists are obviously for recycling. And where the people and, and the people generally as a whole in Los Angeles would rather have it on the tons disposed because this is what will encourage people to go to these recyclers if, if, if it's like fee leveling. So all I wanted to say is you, you have to weigh this. We're over here in the Bureau of Sanitation, Allied Waste, Waste Management and Republic are in favor of gross receipts and that should give you pause and make you think why would they want it because it's in their advantage and it's not an advantage of recycling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Becky Van Dixon. Good morning. My name is Becky Bendixson, Ben Dixon, and I reside in the Knollwood community of Granada Hills. I appear here today to ask that you adopt Motion 37B before you that would encourage recycling of materials that would otherwise be put in the dumps in the valley. Our community has been dumped on too much for far too long a time. Current council members Galanter, Ridley Thomas, Mizikowski, and Pacheco hope to make Sunshine Dump a contradiction in terms of the largest dump in the United States. Thank you, Council Members Holden, Brunson, and Padilla, for your support in voting against opening this dump. The governing body of which you are members has allowed over 20 oil wells to be drilled next to this dump, which is less than a mile from the Cascades where your water flows and the MWD Water Filtration Treatment Facility is located. We've allowed the residents of Casteg, Palmdale, Lancaster, Santa Clarita, and points in between to fill Balboa Boulevard each day and night, which has had its four lanes expanded to six lanes. Under Balboa Boulevard, Boulevard, the only way out of the neighborhood for many people, you've allowed oil, gas, pipelines, and a major, major water trunk line to be placed, two of which ruptured in the 94 earthquake. You've allowed the storage of chlorine tanks without plans to evacuate residents during an emergency situation should they leak, and dynamite to be stored near the dump. You've allowed noisy firing police range in our neighborhood and noisy stage two airplanes, not allowed other airports in the area to fly in and out of Van Nuys Airport over Belleville. The dump continues to release toxic fumes. I had the unpleasant experience of breathing such fumes, a combination of sewer and chemical smell, while visiting as a resident near the dump this past Saturday. How the children at the nearby Van Gogh Elementary School will fare is a disturbing thought. BFI was required to set up a monitoring system over eight months ago at the nearby Van Gogh Elementary School, but when I inquired what the results had been reported, the answer was none to the affected school. We now know radioactive waste has been dumped in our landfills, along with body parts previously illegally dumped at Sunshine Dump. And now we find out the 118 freeway that runs right down the middle of Granada Hills will be used to transport radioactive waste from the nuclear power plants on its way to Yucca Mountain. What's next, I ask? No wonder the majority of residents in the valley feel secession is our only hope to survive. Please give us this little crumb from your table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Judy Gregory and Joan Edwards. Good morning, members of the Council. My name is Judy Gregory, and I'm here representing Solid Waste Recycling and Disposal. I'm also the LA County Elected Board Member to the California Resource Recovery Association, which is the largest state recycling association in the United States. This is a very important issue. This issue goes beyond collecting fees for the city. It, it speaks to recycling and waste reduction, and, and what the city of LA does will, will be heard mimic probably throughout the United States. Um, I really want to commend Councilman Lavage and the Public Works Committee for supporting and listening to environmentalists and to the stakeholders in this issue and for putting forward a proposal that addresses our needs and concerns. And I really urge the City Council to support item 37B and a tonnage-based um, uh, fee on disposal. 
it, it will the, create incentives to reduce la, wasting, increase recycling, and, and overall a huge benefit to the city of Los Angeles and all of its residents. residents. Any other way manera, just, just doesn't accomplish no, anything no other than collecting fees, de, and, uh, and the uh, stakeholders here are willing to, to ante up, we're willing to pay fees, but we want to also do something positive for the environment at the same time, and we hope you'll support us and support the 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 businesses and recycling companies, waste hauling companies that have put a tremendous amount of money into an infrastructure that supports recycling. Thank you. My name is Joan Edwards. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I will not be able to be here tomorrow, but I did send uh, a uh, memorandum to each council office. First, I want to reiterate what Judy Gregory said. This is about whether or not you're willing to encourage recycling in the city of Los Angeles. And the original ordinance did not do that, or did it far too little. The, uh, the recommendation by Councilman LeBange does does just the opposite. It recognizes that there's more than 800,000 tons of recycling capacity in this city that is not being fully utilized because Sunshine Canyon is cheaper. And yet the Bureau of Sanitation has said, give no reward to anyone who uses those facilities. Because instead of having 20 different little piles, mixed paper here and metal here and wood there, it allows the material to be combined and sent to a facility that can sort it. Sort it at rates at above to 85%. The Bureau has said, doesn't matter. It, it's equal to going to a landfill and should have the fee. This is unfair. You've also been told it's too hard to audit tonnage. Too hard. 20 haulers in the city of Los Angeles transport 90% of every ton. 20 auditors have been proposed, or at least we've been told, that they're recommended. That means one city employee to audit one company for 12 months full time makes no sense to any of us, and we respect city employees far too much. I urge you to consider all the ramifications of the original proposed ordinance and the modification proposed by Councilman Labanche's office, and please vote for recycling and not for disposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes today's public comment. Uh, thank you all for being here. And as you heard this announced previous year testimony, uh, item number 19, which is really a duplicate of item 37, which you can file. Item 37 will be continued until tomorrow, but we will take into account uh, your testimony today. Uh, Mr. Clerk, next time, please. Point of information, Mr. President, will people be allowed to speak tomorrow on item 37 if they choose? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, gracias. Mr. Pacheco? Mr. Pacheco. I'm not sure where staff Mr. is, but I requested a report during budget and finance deliberations, deliberations that was going to either by council district or area planning, planning commission uh, break down uh, who was going to be impacted, who was going to be paying these fees, and I haven't received that report. So I just want that report generated by tomorrow. If it's not generated by tomorrow, I'm not going to vote on this. All staff, please be advised of Mr. Chekhov's request. Any other questions on these items? Seeing none, Mr. Clark, next item, please. Item number 17, called special by Council Member Garcetti, is an item for which public hearing has been held. Mr. Garcetti, item 17. Um, if, if we can hear the public comments first. Mr. Padilla. 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 Is there any objection? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Judith Raskin. Mr. Rudy Raskin. Let's come forward at this time. Mr. Padilla. Mr. Padilla. Mr. Padilla. I'm the chairperson of the Echo Park Community Action Committee, which for six years has followed the trials and travails of the Glendale Carter Improvement Project. Uh, for the first five and a half years, we vigorously opposed certain elements of it, but early this year, uh, sufficient changes were made to the project that the community feels that it was supported, and that's what we're doing today. We do ask for one thing. 
We would like uh, the motion to be amended to include an instruction to the LA Department of Transportation to work more closely with the MTA on this project since it is one of two projects, two transportation projects which are side by side. And uh, we want to make certain that they work synergistically. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. This concludes public Esto comment on this item. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Judy, for coming down here today. Um, this was, uh, for many of you were sworn for in, for many of you were sworn in I think, my first day in office, and an issue that came before us. And I want to praise the Department of Transportation for their, their outreach, um, their tireless hours, and their creative thinking, really, when we, uh, from the community, spoke very loudly and clearly about what we did not want, and we came back with some very innovative solutions and had real time to allow community buy-in and for us and the community to feel uh, more secure about uh, the plan, and I think the one that came forward is one that improves um, the area for the folks that actually live there, as well as um, for the transportation element as well. And that's an important step, and I, wanna, I, I can't thank DOT enough for that hard work. I do want to add as an amendment um, what Ms. Raskin uh, added that if we can instruct the DOT to work closely with the MTA on the Terminus project, I believe is what you're referring to, the Glendale Terminus project, which is just up um, the street, um, and there is a clear linkage between the two, so if we can make sure that we have that included as well, I would urge everyone to support this. Uh, the Terminus project is um, uh, over $10 million that uh, Javier Becerra got out of the federal government to improve the uh, terminus of the Glendale Freeway, and we're looking at it as an opportunity potentially to add more green space to the uh, area um, along the sort of field and the flyover. Uh, and the community has spoken very loudly and clearly they don't want the destruction of that bridge, so which um, symbolized the victory over the extension of the freeway many years ago. So we want to uh, make sure that, that as we look at how that's going to be spent, that we um, have DOT um, coordinate with the MTA very closely. So I urge your support. Can I just uh, ask a question, Mr. President? You say that there, was, there was some talk about stopping the freeway at some point. Is that still in this report? It, it, is, it is stopped, as you know where it is, but, um, but you mean further back on the five or something like that? That is one of the options the community has, has talked about for some time. Is there a report? Uh, not in this report, because this is further down on Glendale Boulevard. This is just getting DOT to when we go to that next phase to make sure that they work closely with MTA, because MTA is the one that's overseeing after Caltrans. Right. I just want to say I compliment you, Councilman Garcetti, on your work here on a very difficult problem. When uh, freeway systems were built and not completed, traffic leaks freeways and goes through the neighborhoods. So they uh, crisscross all through the neighborhoods, so it's very important to try to allow the traffic to flow safely through the neighborhood, allow the people to cross the street. Uh, safely, but also to allow traffic to go through, and I don't, I just want to make sure I, we don't, we're not trying to close that access point, but to make it safer for the people in the neighborhood, safer for the motoring public who come in uh, through Glendale Boulevard and then leave the area there, so in Southern County. Okay. And that you mentioned the timing, the sort of deal with the everything they can do there to get a little more would be great, and even some restriping to uh, allow some things to flow a little bit easier, but all people are welcome on the public streets of Los Angeles, so we try to keep big traffic on bigger streets and make it safe for people to cross and keep it out of neighborhoods so that they don't cut through the neighborhoods. Thank you and congratulations to you and your community organization. Mr. Burnson. Mr. Burnson. Yes, uh, just a little history that Tom didn't give you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, I'm happy to support uh, this, this and fact, I worked with Jackie uh, originally to start this, this project. But, uh, but what you have to understand is that, is that uh, the reason that the, the two freeway doesn't continue all the way to Santa Monica, to Santa Monica is because people es la gente didn't want to have a freeway. No and freeway. now they are Ahora stuck with the results of their actions, or so at least the people who are here now are stuck with the results of their actions. And as we continue to get more and more population and more and more cars, you will find out that uh, some of these nimbyism situations uh, create a lot of problems for, for people who are here now. And this is one of those cases. So uh, we can move forward with this, and we should, because it's the best we can do. But had that freeway been built, as it should have been built, it would have alleviated Traffic, traffic and congestion, and not only on our city streets, but on our other freeways as well. 
Mr. Lavage. I was trying to reform Mr. Burns and Seth because I forgot to mention something. The city of Los Angeles, as you may or may not know, designed the Hollywood Freeway in the early 50s all the way out to Barham. It was our designers who did that. And in Vermont Avenue and the Hollywood Freeway, it wasn't because Caltrans at that time, the State Division of Highways, was so green that they wanted to have that beautiful open space. It was there that the interchange was going to go between the Beverly Hills connector and the Glendale connector. But you make a very good point because of the deletion of a freeway or a stop freeway, just like you had the problem with the Long Beach freeway on in the El Torino community, the 710 traffic that's through neighborhoods in Los Feliz Boulevard is severely impacted because of this, which did do. But now we're going to try to make some changes, and also we're going to try to include a more call or people to move and encourage them to do that. But anyway, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Burns, and Mr. Garcetti and this community. Other members wishing to be recognized? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, there is an amended motion that was before Mr. Garcetti is an amendment motion. I believe it's fair. And it's item number 17 as amended. Let's close the roll on the item as amended. To close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 eyes. That is approved. Approved. Next item, please. Mr. President, item number 18. The bids were opened this morning in the city administrative officer prepared a resolution for council to adopt. Has the resolution been circulated? Uh, no, I'm going to read it into the record. There are several bids for the total amount issued on this matter. The winning bidders are as follows. J.C. Morgan in the amount of $50 million at a true interest cost at 1.562. Goldman Sachs, the amount of bid is $50,050 million at a true interest cost at 1.569 percent. Bear Stearns for $50 million at a true interest cost of 1.574 percent. Morgan Stanley, $50 million at a true interest cost of 1.578 percent. And J.P. Morgan, $50 million at 1.582 percent. And Goldman Sachs, $82,600,000 at 1.583 percent. There is also an ordinance that has been submitted by the city attorney, and that should go over for a reading tomorrow. But, uh, a motion is required from the floor to adopt the resolution today. Is there such a motion? To hear a motion from the floor. Mr. Rudy Thomas moves. Mr. Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. That is approved, Mr. Lavanch. Members, uh, just for a quick introduction, what we have here is a great athlete who just retired from volleyball. volleyball. Megan Pereira, please stand here. Her mother is Terry Alatori uh, for the mayor's office. Megan, stand up. The benefit of Title IX and the work of uh, women's sports. Uh, a great athlete from Oregon State. Uh, first. Uh, team all pac 10 and uh, a great volleyball player went to play in Europe, which uh, so many people do in the international sports world. And it's uh, come visit your mother at work day today, so she came down. And uh, we just want to welcome Megan Prieta and congratulate her for her great work as a student. She's going back to get her master's in education and a great work as an athlete and as an inspiration to young women throughout. Please join me in welcoming Megan Prieta back to Los Angeles. Mr. Clerk, next item, please. Item number 24. Uh, motion is required in as much as this is submitted without recommendation and council member Zine called this special. Mr. Zine. Mr. Zine in chambers. Mr. Zine, Mr. Zine, stay in the camera. Item 24. Do you have a motion on item 24? Yes, Mr. President, yes, colleagues, uh, President, colleagues. Uh, my motion is the that uh, is there are still many unresolved questions on this matter. In this uh, solution, in this I would refer this to information technology, technology and also to personnel that came out of my committee without, committee without a recommendation. In order for us to bring it back, we're going to have to deny this request. It will have to come back. It has not gone through the information technology. It did go through personnel. I had many reservations regarding it, and that's why it was set before this body without a recommendation, so what I ask that we deny this, and uh, it can go through the process through personnel and through information technology.
because the, uh, the concern is many to mention at the committee. I said we would hash it out on the floor of the council, but I think it's more appropriate to deny it at this stage and bring it back to the committee process, but we'd have to deny it in order to have that happen. So I would ask that we deny the request, and then we can deal with the information technology agency and do it through the process, through personnel, and also through information technology. That would be my request that we deny it. Thank you, Mr. Zai. Other members wish to be heard on this item? Mr. Brinson. Mr. Brinson. You know, I, I appreciate the diligence of uh, Mr. Zayn uh, in dealing with the freeze that we have and so forth. But uh, I just wonder, uh, is this a vital position? Has anybody found out whether this is something that if we're delaying it, we have to start all over again? And what is the impact going to be? Mr. Zayn, maybe you can enlighten us on that before we vote. Well, the problem is, uh, Mr. Burton, the information technology department has gone through some turmoil and some change. There are a number of contract renewals that are up. There are a number of going on the extensions. There's a concern about the mergers. There's a concern about. So, is there a good reason for delay? There's a number of issues that are at place. Uh, why it's not going through the civil service system, why it's going outside the civil service system. Uh, there's a myriad of, of reasons, or okay. maybe explanations that I wasn't given adequately. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we're not. Uh, routinely sending everything back to committees, not just personnel, but other committees, uh, when some of these things are important for us to provide our vital services for the city. That is, apparently, this is not the case. In this particular case, there are still personnel within the information technology that can process. There are four contractors at this time within the city. There are a number of contractors. I respect your diligence. But I would say yesterday in the personnel committee, we did approve a number of department requests for a number of issues, and we're not trying to be but in this particular case, there's serious questions and issues, and that would be my request to, to the body to please deny. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zayn. Mr. Bernson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I said thank you, Mr. Bernson. Was that a you're welcome? Thank you. Are the members wishing to be recognized? Seeing none, we do yes, have Mr. Zayn's uh, motion to deny this item. Mr. Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, that is denied. Okay, and as Mr. Zayn has requested, we will have this item to return to council for further consideration. Mr. Clerk, next item, please. Next item, item number 35, the Department of Human Services, 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 Human
The matter before us, yeah, colleagues, so it's is, be it's, it's, you know, who would have thought we would have to deal with a situation like this? But a company has put up a billboard in my district um, with a, uh, a cartoon figure of a gentleman sitting on a toilet, and underneath that depiction uh, is an obscenity. Now, this is at the corner of Wilshire Boulevard and San Vicente in West Los Angeles. But the billboard, interestingly enough, doesn't face down Wil Wilshire Boulevard. It, 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 the billboard faces down San Vicente into uh, an exclusively residential neighborhood. So um, families, kids, uh, senior citizens, everybody who lives in that community has to face this billboard every day. And, uh, the content is quite offensive. Uh, the content uh, is demeaning to the community uh, and uh, disrupts the quality of life in that community. And I think we need to ask ourselves the following questions today. Number one, from Mr. Kime, can you tell us, is there anything about the permit history of this billboard or its permit status uh, that gives us an option to go against the billboard? Secondly, from the city attorney's office, we have received a memo today outlining uh, portions of law. I have a lot of legal questions about your memo, but I'd like you to explain um, why it is the city attorney's office's view that no legal uh, case ought to be brought against this billboard on grounds uh, of obscenity. And then number three, if that is indeed the conclusion of the city attorney's office, we all need to confront this basic fact. If this billboard can stand here in this residential neighborhood, it can be placed in any residential neighborhood in this city, and maybe we ought to explore if there is a legal means to do something about that, and I think there might be. So those are three questions I'd ask Mr. Kai to start with number one, and Ms. Karnas with two and three, and if you can hold my time, please. Uh, good morning, Dave Kai with the Department of Building and Safety. Uh, we investigated whether or not the sign structure itself was legally constructed, and uh, through our research on the permits, we found that on November 13, 1984, a permit was issued for the sign structure to be mounted on that roof. Um, at, subsequent to that, two years later, the city banned rooftop or roof-mounted signs, uh, generally speaking. But this one has a non-conforming right to be there, the structure itself. So it is a legally permitted sign structure, double-faced sign structure. So what's your conclusion then? It's a legally permitted uh, double sign rooftop structure that was built in 1984 with a permit. And is there any salience as far as building and safety is concerned, as far as the permitting issue is concerned? Uh, an allegation has been raised that Company A uh, acquired that permit and owns the billboard uh, or leases the space from Company B. Company B has now denied Company A allegedly access to the billboard and uh, does that have any, if, if those facts were true, would it have any impact on your analysis? No, Councilman, it doesn't. Uh, that's a civil matter between the, the alleged sign owner, the property owner, etc. Uh, as far as we're concerned, from a legal point of view, this sign is a permitted sign regardless of who owns it or who controls it. Perhaps you can clarify that. Do we have any uh, protests on the part of the property owner uh, with respect to it? Uh, is he cooperating? Uh, do we know any of those uh, details at all, Mr. Kine? Well, we haven't asked. Building and Safety has not asked the, the property owner to do anything with the sign. Our, our part of the investigation. What is the property owner saying, if anything? We haven't even spoke with the property owner. What's the basis of saying this is legally permitted? Because it is a permitted sign, Council. A permit was taken out in 1984 and has a right to exist at that location in its current physical form in terms of its size, height, location. Um, now, that's in terms of our um, LAMC. On, on a civil level, it may be different. Now, let's see, Attorney Kersler, my question of building a safety, has there been any conversation with the um, owner? With respect to, we haven't spoken with the owner, Councilor, but 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 we haven't spoken with the owner, Counc
not only the legality, no but in fact, the, the propriety, propriety the short of any de violation of civil liberties as would be established by the Constitution, is an order by the building safety. And we deserve feedback as to whether the letter of the law has in fact been complied with, because it is not clear to me that such is the case, and to the extent that uh, it may not be the case, perhaps, and Mr. White says an opportunity uh, to remedy this. Um, there's a lot of rumor as to what did or did not go on, and I think uh, our city departments are obliged uh, to know factually what is going on and report out to uh, the members of the council uh, at a time uh, certain designation, Mr. President. Uh, if, can I respond? Councilman, we, as I said, we, the, the, the structure itself is permitted. In terms of whether or not the content is something that we can regulate, is we've been meeting with the city attorney and, and are going on their advice in terms of time I'll repeat. It would seem to me it would be well if you deem it appropriate in terms of the scope of your authority to know specifically what happened in that instance. In, I'm not sure I understand what instance you're talking about, Councilman. The instance of this sign going up, when it is, we're not talking structure. We need to get feedback. It's either building and safety, the city attorney, or any other uh, entity within the city family that can uh, cause us to find the information that we seek. Councilman, there's no provision in our Los Angeles Municipal Code that allows me to regulate content. I'm not asking you when they change a copy. Listen to my question. It is essentially to investigate, not regulate. Mr. Weiss has raised an issue of uh, uh, quality of life de cal, de and indeed posed the question of the propriety of what's there. The Obviously, that's a content issue. There may be ways to address this issue short of getting, in turn, getting into legal entanglements. Uh, I'm simply suggesting, Mr. President, that the Building and Safety Department and whoever else is deemed appropriate investigate what specifically happened there so that the Council can have a handle on uh, how we might take appropriate action if at all. There is a motion. Is there a second? Mr. Weiss seconds. Ms. Galantra. I think it would be worth noting that it isn't always necessary to go through legalistic structures and uh, the courts or the departments. We had a similar problem in my district, not very far from this actually, uh, not long ago in which a uh, billboard went up that the community and I found very offensive and we were able to basically browbeat the advertiser into yes, taking yes, it yes, down. Yes, this yes, didn't require yes, building yes, safety. Yes, I mean, we did all that. The billboard yes, was perfectly legal, yes, and the sign, in fact, yes, was perfectly yes, legal. But because yes, the community, yes, community yes, was willing yes, to call yes, the advertiser, yes, yes, my office yes, called the advertiser, the, uh, the people who objected, yes, the homeowner yes, associations, yes, everybody yes, called yes, the advertiser yes, and basically yes, made yes, the, yes, the life yes, of the advertiser a yes, living hell until they changed the billboard, which they eventually did. It didn't happen as quickly as it might have if the billboard had been illegal, but there are many ways to go about getting rid of an offensive billboard. And in the time it would take for building and safety or the city attorney to do any kind of an investigation, uh, and, and the communities in the area that Mr. Weiss is talking about are very effective in this kind of thing. If given the proper phone number of the advertiser, they can, uh, they can do a very effective job. I, I do not say that to say we shouldn't crack down on illegal billboards. Of course, we should crack down on illegal ones. But where they are legal but offensive, there are other methods for letting the, uh, the people who are making money off it know that, uh, that the community doesn't like it. And I Certainly, uh, many of the homeowners groups who were involved in the billboard in my district are momentarily going to be Mr. Weiss's constituents, and I know they would be more than happy to help you in this. But I think that uh, you, you can do a great deal without building and safety and without uh, the legality, the legal issues, just by uh, basically filling their phones with complaints from the people who are offended by this. It's, it's been known to work. Before, not sure it will work again. President, um, uh, I think Ms. Galanter uh, speaks uh, from the vantage point of experience and wisdom, and uh, I would simply want to suggest that uh, what she uh, just indicated is hardly uh, 
to contradict what I'm suggesting. Uh, they are um, um, complimentary, uh, and it would seem to me uh, that both uh, uh, can proceed um, uh, simultaneously. I would uh, think that there is uh, a city agency that ought to be on point, uh, Mr. Weiss, uh, that comes back to your office or to the body as a whole to deal with it, and if there is grassroots organizing that complements that, all the better. Mr. Pacheco, followed by Ms. Mikowski and Mr. Burns. Mr. President and colleagues, um, the First Amendment and First Amendment issues are always difficult uh, because we all uh, believe and stand for the First Amendment of freedom of expression. And if I understand the LA Times correctly, this is a death row records uh, advertisement uh, and death row records, which is very popular uh, in the community and always does some controversial cutting edge. Uh, I think most of their records have the parental advisory uh, label on them, uh, you know, that urban rap uh, music. Uh, but I think one of the basic things I wanted to ask for was, does anyone have a picture of what we're talking about? Because before I can decide, all right, can, you, can we circulate it or is it, can you email it to me or something? Um, before I can decide, uh, what my position is, I want to see what we're talking about. And yeah, maybe there's a way of dealing with it informally, because I know that uh, uh, I uh, also have used the same practice that Ms. Galantra has identified, where we had uh, some adults, uh, gentlemen clubs, advertisements in inappropriate locations, and uh, we called the advertiser, and we called the uh, the company, La compañía. and so they uh, were more than willing to relocate that advertisement. Uh, so maybe we should try that first. Maybe uh, Councilor Weiss can call uh, Death Row Records and work with them and see if they'd be willing to uh, accommodate his request to relocate this sign uh, somewhere else. Uh, and then I'll get back to you after I review the material. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Mitsikowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, one, I want to thank the city attorney for responding quickly. I have read this, and I don't know that we've had the city attorney tell us your review. Maybe we should go over that and hold my time for a minute. So can we have the city attorney tell us your what is in your letter? Just sum, 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 summarize it. Mr. President, honorable members, Sharon Cedar Cardenas, assistant city attorney. Um, based upon the motion that was put in by Council Member Weiss, we are reporting back to this body regarding the sign that's located at Wilshire and San Vicente. At the outset, let me say that for the most part, our sign ordinance does not regulate content. The only time that we regulate content is that obscene signs are prohibited. In, um, and basically, those are tied to the State of California Penal Code, Section 311. In looking at the cases that have interpreted that section, and also United States Supreme Court precedent, we have determined, and if I can find the quote, um, that basically, whether it's the depiction or the words on it, that what the court said was that for either words or a picture to be obscene, there has to be a sexual content. Just using a four-letter word by itself or a depiction of, sit of someone sitting on a toilet, absent a sexual connotation would not be considered obscene. And therefore, it was our conclusion after looking at the picture of the sign and going through the case law that a court would not find this particular sign content to qualify as obscene. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Um, that is 
pretty clear, and I, often we have concerns with some city attorney letters which leave a little bit of area of gray or say, well, it's not quite clear. This one doesn't say that. This one says you've looked at it, you've looked at the court cases, and that you believe that the court would not find this sign uh, in question obscene, and that, therefore, uh, the city attorney speaking, we cannot enforce our ordinance against this sign. Uh, I appreciated the efforts that Mr. Weiss uh, first pres uh, presented with the question of building and safety, and this is the sign itself legal. And Mr. Kime also answered that very succinctly, saying, yes, the sign is legal. It would not be allowed today as a roof structure, but it was allowed when it went in. There are no appurtenances, no enlargements, no things like that that would be under our sign's control that give us that latitude. I also want to uh, echo what Mr. Lanter said. I think the billboard in question is one of them, but there's another story where it's very similar, where the pressure from the community wasn't on the advertiser, the pressure on the community was on the building owner. Uh, where they said, do you want something like this on your building, and isn't it terrible? And the building owner not being a person who saw his building very often took a look at the billboard that the community was raising and said, yes, I'm going to have it uh, changed. So there have been efforts and um, times when the community pressure really is what it comes down to and was very, very effective. Um, I think we have to accept what the city attorney said. Is the sign offensive? Yes. yes. People are looking at it. Um, people will find it various, to various degrees offensive. Is it more offensive uh, because given this double-faced billboard, there's a sign that affects and faces Wilshire Boulevard, and part of which is actually blocked by the building itself, and would that have been a preferable place to put it as opposed to the approach on San Vicente, which uh, goes south to the single-family community? Um, that would have been preferable. Is the issue of dispute between the civil uh, owners of the building, the owner of the sign, the, um, I mean, the billboard companies, the dispute between the uh, two billboard companies, an issue that we should be involved in? Um, I think not. I think were we to interfere and attempt to interfere, we would be potentially putting the city out there, involving ourselves in a potential liability issue that we ought not, can't afford and ought not to get involved in. Um, again, I think the best effort here is community pressure on one hand, and on the other hand is uh, very often folks like this exactly what billboards want. Made you look, made you react, made you have more press, made you uh, made have just more focus on this is uh, sort of to literally to turn our back to the sign. I think uh, not getting involved, not letting this rise to another level of issues, which the city attorney's department and building and safety are telling us that we have no strong legal ground uh, and just create more of a threshold. And we're going to invite in members of the council, all of those civil liberties groups, all of those who strongly believe right or wrong on, on this particular issue, but we believe very rightly in the first I have something here sitting on my desk which has often guided me on these issues. It says, First Amendment issues are always unpopular. That's why we need First Amendment. That is a quote from Floyd Abrams, a long-standing civil rights attorney, civil liberties attorney, who fought for the, right of, for the rights of freedom of speech. And I think that has to guide us here, particularly since this doesn't in any way, even from the city attorney's office, give us the latitude of coming close to an area where it's worth fighting and worth um, really, really uh, precipitating. So I think that's what has to guide us, and that's why it, I, I, would, I don't think there's a motion before us other than accepting this report from the city attorney, but that's what I would cautiously advise the uh, council members to do. Thank you, Ms. Mitsikowski. Before calling the next speaker, uh, public hearing has been opened and closed, but we do have uh, John Carroll from Clear Channel here. Uh, I'd move to reopen so we can just say a few words before we continue with the council discussion. Mr. Carroll. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Honorable members, my name is John Carroll. I'm the real estate manager for Clear Channel Outdoor here in Los Angeles. Uh, we just want to let you know that the sign contents on top of the building there at San Vicente Wilshire are not ours. They are the lessors um, with the death row record. We are in the middle of a lease dispute with them, and they actually basically took down the ad copy we had up there and have taken the signs over for their own use. Our attorneys are dealing currently with their attorneys to correct the signs of our lease dispute. Uh, we want to let you know that we would never condone this type of advertising. We have our own uh, internal uh, codes that we would not put something like this on the streets ourselves, and we support any actions that the city council may take to get the ad copy that's currently 
other down. And I can tell you that if we are unable to resolve our dispute with the landowner, we will be removing the signs of the entire, the entire structures from the roof uh, at the moment we're hoping we're able to negotiate a settlement with them that will allow us to continue our tenancy. And that is the status of where we're at in this whole situation. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Mr. Burns. Yes, uh, Mr. President, members of the Council, I appreciate the comments just made by the representative, and I think they're very appropriate. And obviously, uh, there are a number of issues here, and one of which we have no control, which is the uh, First Amendment issue. But I would like to ask, uh, Dave, could you tell us uh, when was our ordinance put into effect that prohibited rooftops? 1986. 1986. So this preceded it, so it was a was legal structure. By two years of procedure, the councilman, therefore, it has a non-conforming right as many rooftop signs. I understand. Now, I, I, not in this case, because we've already been told by the company that they will remove the structure if necessary. Uh, and I appreciate that, because that's the right thing to do. But, uh, as you know, or maybe some of you don't know, there is a uh, state law that uh, protects the industry and, and gives them amortization when, when signs are removed uh, without their uh, permission or without their consent. And uh, I was just wondering whether our nuisance laws could apply if you throw out the First Amendment portion and not have it for First Amendment reasons, but for other reasons, we have the ability uh, to impose nuisance abatement uh, measures in land use cases. I don't know that it's ever been tested on the case of an amortization of a billboard, and this probably wouldn't be the right case anyway because it involves First Amendment rights. But it'd be an interesting uh, topic uh, that we might, in the future, uh, you know, there was a time when, uh, when conditional use permits uh, could not be uh, revoked until we offered an uh, ordinance that allowed us uh, to revoke conditional use permits if we could make the findings that they were uh, contrary to the public interest. And I'm just wondering whether we might explore in the future on some of these where people are not as cooperative as the gentleman has offered to be here, and I, we do appreciate that, by the way. And I think it's the right thing to do. Have you suggested to the uh, company that they should remove this? Just give me a yes or no, have you? Yes. And they refused? Well, yes, the, uh, the death of the records. Have you suggested to them that you will not uh, honor any of their future business if they don't? Yes, we have had those communications. And they still, uh, have, they're still adamant about it, huh? Yeah, they're pretty obstinate. Do you intend to keep your promise and not take future business with them? Yes, we do. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Ms. Perry. Senator Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, this is a question for Building and Safety, possibly Clear Channel. Um, the gentleman from Clear Channel indicated that the lessor took down their copy, their copy, Clear Channel's copy, and put up their own. And my question to you is, is that a, an activity that they could conduct without approval or some sort of clearance or permit or review by building and safety just to remove, copy, and put up? Yes, council member, the answer is that changes of copy on off-site signs such as these do not require a permit or any approval process whatsoever. We do not regulate change of copy itself. We regulate the initial permitting um, and inspection of the billboards um, and, and maintain their size, location, et cetera, but we do not regulate copy changes. Okay, so I'm talking about the actual physical act of changing it, not what's, what the content is. Yeah, no, no permit is required to change the copy and no approval process is required to change a copy on a billboard. Well, I, I have many of the same problems that Mr. Weiss has, unfortunately, in the 9th Council District, and I'm looking for an expeditious way of approaching this, and if there's some way to find that they haven't conformed to uh, a process or gotten proper review, I hope that you will uh, consider those issues when conducting your investigation as directed. Yes. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues. So, so, so what has been done in this case, they hijacked the billboard. They hijacked the billboard. They went out, 
and remove what was on the billboard and put what they wanted on the billboard against the wishes of Clear Channel, which owns the billboard. There must be some sections in trespassing, there must be some sections in a code that that is illegal to take down what a company is paid for and owns and there's ownership rights. And what happens around the city if individuals decide to remove what's on the billboard that's being paid for by the advertiser and put up their own advertisement, whatever it be, whether it's a good taste or bad taste, there must be some section somewhere in some code, a trespassing section, a vandalism section of something that can be done to remove this. Well, it's theft of what was up there, but in essence, death row records, you take the name death row records, and you wonder what they're up to, and they hijack a billboard, and we look into the books and look into the arena of constitutional protections and rights, and there's constitutional protections and rights for the owners of that billboard. And as Ms. Galantra said, have the community up in arms, well, who are they going to complain to? Because the people on the billboard don't want it up there. This is a hijacked billboard, and I don't know how often this happens, maybe Mr. Carroll can answer. Has this ever happened before where someone's hijacked the billboard? Um, very rarely, but even it has, we've been able to uh, impress upon them that that's not the way to go about it, and they don't have a right to the property. We actually had re uh, removed the copy of the old ads that were up there and put up Beverly Hills Tourism that we had contracted for, and they turned around two days and removed that ad copy and put up the new ones right now that are causing all the problems. Well, I know that there's got to be yes, some section, maybe our city attorney can answer, in the penal code that would apply to vandalism or trespassing or some section. Because if someone's putting up another advertisement on billboard and they fall and they hurt themselves and they sue Clear Channel and they're going to say, well, Clear Channel was liable because they didn't have the safety mechanism up there. I just can't believe that we remain helpless when they're putting this billboard up against the wishes of the owner and they're not being cooperative and it's not like they're being good business people and friendly to the community. It is an outrage. They're getting massive publicity. I've seen it on television. I've read it in the newspaper and here it is in city council. And I just can't believe that a city of four million people has to sit idly by and say this is okay. There's got to be some section somewhere that permits the city to go in, permits the owner to go in, and remove it with no harm to their crew that has to go in there to that facility and remove that billboard. So they're not jeopardized. Ms. City Attorney, can you respond to some of those issues, please? Thank you, Mr. Council Member Councilmember Zayn, I am um, I'm not very familiar with criminal law because I don't practice in that area. However, if Clear Channel believes that its rights have been violated either by way of theft or vandalism or something like that, they can certainly make a report to the Los Angeles Police Department who would investigate, determine whether they felt a crime was committed and then could refer, depending on whether it was a felony or a misdemeanor crime, to either the district attorney or our office for Okay, I, I would ask that Mr. Carroll, if you will complete a report with the Los Angeles Police Department to that effect, and we can bring in the penal code to bring in the criminal prosecution, whether we know who did or not, and you can reclaim property rights of that billboard and get that removed. Maybe that might be the most expeditious way. Mr. Zayn, are you willing to do that? Yes, we are. That sounds like an amending motion, Mr. Zayn. There's a second. There's a second. But we can consider that report back. Along with uh, Mr. Willie Thomas' suggestion as well, Ms. Grohl. I have a question as well, and I don't know if it's from the, for the representative of Clear Channel or not. I mean, the question that we've all raised, and if that they've put this up, whether you agree with the content of it, I think actually is not necessarily as much the issue of putting it up when the, it is your billboard that they cannot, uh, that, that you own. Can you not go up and take it down right now? Well, we have, and they have okay. gone ahead and put back up our copy. Uh, the other issue is that it's tough to access this building. They have guns and armed guards, and they've been given pretty strict orders about who to allow the property, and if someone's there, it's not have permission to But, but it's your off. billboard. Yes, but it's on their property. Yeah, but there's some, I mean, I guess, agreement that you must have, a contract with the owner that if, because the, you're putting up the billboard, so you go on all the time. That's true. That particular agreement has, though, been terminated. And so we're in the process of, uh, we were in the process of negotiating with them for a renewal, and that, that fell apart uh, about three weeks ago when we thought we had a deal put together. 
Um, as far as their rights yeah, to believe, they don't have rights to use the billboard. It is our property. Uh, okay, and one thing I would point out, they don't have a license to operate as, as an off-premise sign and exceeds on-premise signage square footage. So they're in violation of your side the way they want to claim that board. So it's their property, but it's your billboard, and they won't allow you access to your own billboard. That's correct. That's correct. And there's no legal recourse uh, you have? I mean, or, it's a civil matter. And so our attorneys are currently in involved with this on civil side. Council member, this is a civil dispute which often happens between two parties where property is involved and uh, it sounds like they, are, they both are represented by attorneys. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. I, Mr. Carroll, if I could ask you to... It's like the popcorn factory. Um, you could just... Uh, clarify for us exactly why it is that Clear Channel is unable to change the copy. Just one more time so we can hear you crystal clear. Okay. Save my time. The signs are located on the roof of the building. It's about a four-story building. The only way you can get to uh, the roof is through the building or through cranes lifting our uh, men up in man baskets to the roof. The uh, owners have armed guards 24 hours around the clock of that building with specific instructions as to who may and may not enter the property. And as a result, they will uh, chase our, our crews away. And, and have, in progress. fact, your crews been chased away? Yes, we've been having and, and were they, in fact, chased away by armed individuals? Yes, they were. Did they actually see the weapons on the individuals? I don't know for sure. That's my understanding. Well, um, I appreciate that, yeah, Mr. Carroll. So 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 I, I have to tell you two things. One, I greatly appreciate the comments of so many of you uh, during this debate. It's been a terrific debate. I want to particularly say, Ms. Galaner, your comments earlier were just absolutely right on point, and I really appreciate that. I appreciate the support of everybody in this chamber uh, who recognizes that if they can do this here in the 5th District, they can do it anywhere. And if armed, if, if armed Guards are going to be used to scare away a billboard company from changing what is patently a grossly offensive billboard, then with all due respect to uh, my colleagues, I do not think we should take uh, uh, the city attorney's report at face value. I think we ought to investigate every option we have, because if this is the way people are going to behave in this city, we need to respond uh, appropriately in, in a way they understand. So I, I have many questions regarding the legal report that's been presented today, and, and perhaps what I'll do is I will discuss those offline with the city attorney's office. Because, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you briefly, Ms. Carter, each and every one of the cases uh, that is cited in this brief, each and every case is distinguishable. Baker uh, deals with one word on a bumper stick. Turner deals with 5402, not 311. And 5402, by the way, has not been found unconstitutional. One clause of 5402 has been found unconstitutional. Not the entire section, not the entire statute, and not the part of the statute dealing with obscenity. Perlman is political speech. Rosales and Pancho deal with nudity alone. So those cases are distinguishable. I do think we may have ultimately a problem uh, legally, which is that our city code section incorporates section 311 by reference. Uh, and section 311 on its face seems to limit obscenity to prurient interest matters, to, to sexual content. Uh, I do not believe that the law of the United States limits obscenity to sexual content. Well, let me ask you that briefly. Hold my time. Do you believe the law of the United States limits obscenity strictly to sexual, erotic, and pornographic materials? Yes, I do. Okay. Do, you have a, do you have a United States Supreme Court case that says that? I don't have it here, no, but yes, I looked at the United States, States Supreme Court case. Okay. I'm not certain that that's no, correct, and I actually think under Lorillard versus Riley, uh, we have an opportunity here to, uh, to craft perhaps a narrowly tailored statute uh, that could address issues of obscenity. Uh, 
uh, on billboards uh, when they are in close proximity to residential neighborhoods, schools, religious institutions, and so on. And so I would ask uh, that we not receive and file this report right now because I think it raises more questions than it answers. I'd like to ask the city attorney's office if they can prepare, and perhaps they should do it for the Plum Committee rather than for full council, Mr. President, a report that looks, looks at, the, at the, the type of laws that were challenged in Lorillard. Um, and, and asks the question, can we craft a narrowly tailored ordinance here? Because any ordinance here, as, as you know, Ms. Carpenter, will be subject to strict scrutiny. But I think you can overcome strict scrutiny uh, conceivably if you tailor your ordinance uh, to uh, uh, signs that are in residential communities, near churches, near schools, so on and so forth. I think we can come up with such an ordinance. I'd like to see a report from the city attorney's office that doesn't just simply shut the door on us, but tells us which doors might be open and where we might have an opportunity. Doesn't tell us the cases that said you can't do this, but indicates where the case law suggests an open. I think we need to look at that, and I think we need to take Mr. Ridley Thomas's suggestion at heart and have building and safety go out, maybe with the LAPD if need be, and do an inspection uh, of this location, because after all, you're going to have to do an inventory anyway. We can't let um, people with billboards and guns intimidate this city. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Mr. Zayn. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just to follow up on that, the, the Constitution and the guarantees of freedom of rights, that's the broad scale. We're talking about one billboard in one location in the city of Los Angeles that has been hijacked by death row records people. And while they have the right to have armed guards on premises to protect their properties, I don't believe they have the right to prevent a billboard company from maintaining their particular billboard. And for this to linger on for months through the litigation of the civil attorneys, which I'm sure it will, there's a civil aspect, there's a criminal aspect. And what I see is a criminal aspect where a criminal act was done, whether it was trespassing or vandalism or something else, that was done in this particular case. And while Councilman Weiss' motion would bring forth an umbrella for the city for billboards and good taste, et cetera, I totally support that. But I think we need to address in this particular case what we're going to do about this particular billboard at this particular location and to remove that as quickly as possible and to assist Clear Channel and their employees to have that happen. What happens when it's taken down and then death row puts something else up and the controversy continues? I don't know. But what we need to address is not the long-term solution but the short-term solution. And Mr. Carroll said he's going to make a police report. That will start the wheels churning, but at the same time, building safety needs to do what they have to do. And if the police department needs to assist you in that activity, then so be it. And we just can't sit idly by while we get in the mumbo-jumbo of legalese. And that's what's going to happen, is we'll go through the legalese of the civil attorneys, and for months this will linger. So I would say when Mr. Carroll makes that report today, process that with the city attorney with the criminal branch, and take action to do what we have to do and get it done as quickly as possible. Because it's one location today, and if we ignore it and we don't take action promptly, we'll have locations throughout the city before we can blink. Mr. Pacheco. Mr. Pacheco. Mr. President, colleagues, I would simply uh, say that I have looked at the uh, billboard and I agree that it's offensive and I would not want it in my neighborhood. Uh, the challenge we have before us is that we're bumping up against a very powerful shield, which is called the First Amendment. Um, I understand what you're saying, Dennis, about people using arms and different things to protect uh, their interests, whether it be commercial, financial, whatever. Uh, but I think um, I just want to make sure that before we do anything, uh, that we don't just you know walk all over the First Amendment and treat it uh, lightly or, or disregard it. And so, as we move this forward, I think we should uh, ask some of the stakeholders in the civil liberties area, the ACLU or uh, the different groups out there who deal with this more regularly uh, to help us review this matter. Because I agree with you, it's maybe not. Uh, 
The, it is not, I say. I agree with yeah, everyone. It's not uh, the most uh, appealing uh, imagery that I want to see in any neighborhood. But I think um, we, we run into this First Amendment issue. I just want to make sure that we don't uh, come across as if we're against the First Amendment. So whatever we do, I just want to make sure we, 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 uh, we uh, have a balanced approach with the First Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Pacheco. Other members wishing to be heard? Seeing none, members, we do have a request by Council Member Zine, a uh, mending motion and suggestion by Council Member Rudy Thomas uh, for a report back and Mr. Weiss's suggestion that uh, this matter not be received in the file, uh, but actually refer to the Plum Committee uh, for further discussion. And I believe that is appropriate venue. Uh, for the report backs and the request for information that have been made. And they're all friendly amendments. And they're all friendly amendments. Friendly amendments. So uh, let's take a vote on uh, uh, approving the uh, amendments and information requested. And in the same stroke, uh, refer the whole entire matter to the Plum Committee uh, for further discussion. Please open the roll. Please close the roll and take the vote. 11 eyes. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, next item, please. Mr. President, not on the agenda, Special 1 is submitted by Council Member Padilla, seconded by Council Member Pacheco, and the City Attorney will speak to the need to make findings. City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there were allocations through Cultural Affairs Department for uh, festivals and programs for the year 2001-2002 because of the September 11th events. Many of these uh, events, the funded events, were canceled. The controller has just informed the council office that they need, that there is a council instruction need uh, for specific accounts and fund numbers to transfer this money before the end of the fiscal year, and therefore the council would need to make the findings that the need to act arose after the posting of the agenda and that there is an immediate need to act. Numbers wishing to be heard on the findings. Seeing none, Mr. Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. Eleven eyes. Special one now before us. Numbers wishing to be heard on the motion itself. Seeing none, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. Eleven eyes. That is approved. Thank you, members. Uh, please. Next item. Mr. President, also not on the agenda, it is special two. It is a resolution that is submitted by Council Member Labonge, seconded by Mr. Bernson. And Mr. Labonge is going to speak to the need to make findings. Mr. Labonge. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of Council, as you may have uh, learned just in the last few days, uh, discussion is taken on in Washington concerning the discontinuance of Amtrak. And, and to change drastically how rail service uh, feeds uh, Los Angeles. As you may or may not know, there's three long country trains, long uh, uh, across the country trains through Chicago. Uh, comes the Southwest Limited, the Sunset Limited to New Orleans, and also the Coast Starlight to Seattle. Long haul trains are very important to people of our city who need an opportunity to travel and travel by train. Uh, this uh, motion that is before your resolution calls on uh, the Congress to act on behalf of Amtrak, and I believe that it will uh, stop them from shutting down, which is scheduled to be tomorrow. We need to act today in this behalf, and I would like to ask that we move to determine that this is a, a motion worthy of consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Bernson. Yes, uh, members of the council, this is a very important issue uh, because we are threatened with the loss of not just uh, our Amtrak service, which is extremely important throughout the country, but it also affects Metrolink. Uh, Metrolink, which services 35,000 riders a day in the Los Angeles basin or the region, which includes five counties, actually six counties, uh, would also be shut down uh, because of the fact that we contract with uh, uh, Amtrak for the engineers and conductors and signal people uh, that we use uh, in our service. So it's a, a drastic matter. I mean, Amtrak is, you know, only services 60,000 people nationwide. On a daily basis, that's all. Sixty thousand nationwide, but uh, 
Metrolink services 35,000 people daily right here in our basin. And you can imagine the impact of 35,000 more cars on our freeway, not to mention those that can't afford an automobile and depend upon public transportation. This is a very critical matter. Uh, we hope that, uh, that uh, Metrolink and uh, Amtrak will continue. Uh, obviously, Metrolink is doing everything within its uh, power to try to continue service even if Amtrak does shut down. Uh, we are in the process now of contacting the unions pursuant to an emergency contract uh, with the uh, engineers, conductors, and signal people so that we can continue should, uh, uh, should Amtrak make their threat complete. Um, we've been assured by uh, uh, Secretary of Transportation uh, Veneta that uh, they will do everything possible. They expect to keep track rolling, we hope. But uh, just in, the, in fact, we did issue a, 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 a news release uh, yesterday from Metrolink. In fact, it's here for those of you that may be. And, and I just want to make everybody, let everybody know that. Uh, Contrary to some of the things that have been carried on television, that Metrolink will automatically shut down, uh, it says as follows, the uncertainty of Amtrak's financial situation has left a number of our Metrolink passengers wondering what will happen to Metrolink's service if Amtrak shuts down. First thing I want to do is to assure our passengers that we're doing everything possible to avoid any interruption in our Metrolink service. In a statement earlier today, Secretary of Transportation Norman Edda said, I am confident we will be able to to avoid a shutdown of services. Well, we hope that's true, but Congress is going to have to do something uh, in order to uh, fund Amtrak in the future. Uh, the hope was that it would be self-sufficient after a number of years. Well, let's be realistic. There is no transportation, uh, rail transportation or bus transportation service in the country that is self-sustaining. It's all subsidized. We spend billions of dollars on freeways and road improvements every year. We call those investments. But on well, the transportation, we call that subsidies. You know, somewhere in there, there's an inequity, if you understand where, where I'm going with this. So I would urge that we immediately contact our representatives in uh, Washington, D.C., and urge them to approve immediately a $200 million funding to keep Amtrak in business after tomorrow, and then to work out some sort of a permanent arrangement so that Amtrak can continue to service uh, the people of our country and uh, enable us to continue servicing uh, the Southern California Basin with Metrolink service. So I, urge I, vote. And I want to thank Mr. LaBonge for bringing this to the Council's attention. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Mr. LaBonge, let's take a vote on the findings. Mr. Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. We now have the motion before us. Mr. Lavange. Uh, call for everybody's support on this very important thing and ask for a friendly amendment from Mr. Burson on the Metrolink issue as it relates to the county-wide system of contracts with uh, region-wide. Region-wide, thank you. Okay, let's open the roll on the item as amended. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Special two is approved. Fourth with please. Next item. Mr. President, uh, now it's time for public comment and non agenda items. Council calls for Phil Tabak. 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 Are you still with us? If not, then the, the public comment period for today's meeting is closed. Next item, please. Motions are posted and referred. Motions shall be posted and referred. Council, uh, referred. council uh, members request uh, for excuse and council uh, attendance. Uh, council uh, member uh, Weiss uh, requests for uh, excuse uh, on June 26th uh, for uh, city uh, business. Uh, a motion is required. Uh, Mr. Pacheco moves. Mr. Weiss is excused. Council member Galanter requests for excuse on July 12th for city business. This meets policy. Ms. Galanter is excused. Council member Zayn requests for excuse on July 2nd to arrive late for city business. This also meets policy. Mr. Zayn is excused. And council member Burnson requests for excuse on June 26th to leave early uh, for city business. A motion is required. Uh, Mr. Weiss moves. Mr. Burnson is excused. The desk is clear. Any announcements? Any announcements? Seeing none, please rise for turning motion.
Mr. Burnson. Yeah, Burnson. Yes, uh, members of the council, I'm very sad to uh, uh, request adjournment for Sarah Rogers of our planning department, who passed away on Sunday, June 23rd. Uh, Sarah worked to join the planning department in 1969 as a clerk stenographer. And through her ability and preservance, rose to the position of associate zoning administrator. Good judgment, dedication, and fairness to and justice impressed everyone she worked with. Her passing is a great loss to all of us. Her family will let us know funeral arrangements in the meantime, is accepting visitors and notes at 3755 Floresta Way, Los Angeles, 90043. They also wanted us to know of the special kindness and help several members of the department gave in Sarah's last months. And I must tell you that uh, having worked with her over the years, and I'm sure that Cindy, uh, we all appreciate uh, Sarah and her cooperation and kindness and the way she went about her business of helping uh, do the city's business and our, uh, our business. Uh, she'll be really missed. She's survived by her husband, Darrell, and his son, Alan Wright. Also, I regret to uh, request adjournment for Antoinette Chalokian, uh, who passed away on June 9, 2002. She is the mother of Ed Chalokian, who is extremely active in the uh, 12th district in the Silmar community, uh, very active in police support and other types of activities. And uh, she's survived by two sons, one of which is uh, uh, Ed and four grandchildren. Thank you. Ms. Glancher. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, I have two. I'd first like to ask that we adjourn in memory of Helen Cassie, who was 78 years old and died after a year-long battle with leukemia. She survived by three children, three grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. One of her children is Mary Ballou Richard of the Venice Family Clinic, and the family has requested that uh, in lieu of flowers, donations be made to the Venice Family Clinic. It's been a rough year for Mary, and I'm sure for the rest of the family as well, including Mrs. Cassie. Um, then I'd like to ask that we adjourn in memory of Florence Georgine Davis, who was the mother of George Cunningham, who writes the Cunningham Report on the Harbor. Um, on harbor issues. She passed away on Friday, just two weeks shy of her 84th birthday. And I'll get you the pertinent details. Any others? Ms. Miskowski. Uh, I would just like to be a co-presenter on the Sarah Rogers tribute, and also in case um, that Sarah was uh, one of the people in the long-standing tradition in the planning department had been that you couldn't become a city planner unless you had gone to college, graduated, and had an advanced degree. And over the years, there were many uh, outstanding employees in the planning department who had started as clerk typists and who rose through the, um, the clerical positions and other administrative positions whose talents were so recognized that the planning department actually and the personnel department actually made a change in the personnel qualifications for becoming a city planner to being just years of experience of working and being able to prove themselves and pass the test. And that those changes were made so that Sarah and uh, a few others like her, who were so valuable in the department, could actually become city planners and recognize their capabilities. And she not only became a city planner in, in, in that uh, change that occurred, but also continued to advance and test against city planners who had academic background and had the master's degree and excelled and rose to a senior level in the, in the planning department as a consequence of that. So she will be sorely missed. She was a a, a real treasure in the planning department, not only in terms of her knowledge, but in terms of her skills and working with the community people uh, and the public. Mr. Pacheco. Mr. President, colleagues, I ask that we adjourn in memory of Anita Ward. Anita was part of a group on the northeast uh, part of Los Angeles known as the Golden Girls. Uh, she passed away on uh, Sunday, June 23rd. Uh, to uh, cancer. Anita was born in Lincoln Heights, moved to Alcerino in 1950 when she was married. She was an active community member uh, since 1960, uh, particularly with the schools and the different community organizations in the Alcerino area. She is survived by her spouse, Dean Ward, her son, Manuel, her stepchildren, Dean, Gail, and Sherry, her sister, uh, Carmen Asolino, uh, one of the other uh, Golden Girls. Ms. Perry. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Ridley Thomas asked me to um, also do this on his behalf for Sarah Rogers, and I just have some additional notes uh, from him that she was the first woman of color to become an associate zoning administrator. And uh, this additional note indicates that her funeral is set for this Saturday at 11 o'clock at Inglewood Cemetery. And the co-presenter on that, well, Edry is. I guess we're all going on it anyway, correct? Yes. Okay, great. All members. Any others? Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you all very much. This meeting is adjourned. City View, Channel 35, your city, your channel. We now join our scheduled program in progress.